gentleman and lady. Oh, I, I, I would have preferred to see more of you. Yeah, that's uh, very including. Yeah, um, so I'm standing between you and your meal. <laughs> and if that's dangerous or not. Uh, digital sovereignty. Um, there is, a, there is a, a definition that uh, the EU has, but that's from, from an economic perspective. Uh, my take on that is not from the economic perspective, it's from the national sovereignty uh, aspect, but I will go into that later on. Uh, feel free to um, interrupt me with questions if you want, if you like. Uh, I always appreciate that, actually. Uh, or we can take that, that afterwards. Uh, yeah, sometimes you have to explain your background also to, to give you some... Uh, uh, context. Uh, I've done a lot of things, but I started uh, with computers in 1979. Uh, then I started with my first uh, Sinclair uh, CTX 80, I think it was. Uh, and, and then I started working 85 after school. Uh, in 95, I started with IT security professional IT security, uh, when I got an assignment when I was working at the, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Sweden, I, I got an assignment to go to Moscow and setting up a secure uh, network for the Swedish Embassy. So that's where I learned IT security for real. Because that, uh, at that point the enemy was right outside the door and in, in my face. Uh, but that's a different story. But that's where I started out. Uh, and, in, and somehow I ended up in the, in the security service, the Swedish security service, uh, uh, not in, the, uh, yeah, and, and the rest is history. And I've done a lot of things in, the, in, the, in this field, setting up the, uh, the armed forces, IT, defense unit, and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, you can read uh, that, that on the internet. But I've also been a hacker. Remember, I started in 1979, and that was hacking. Uh, but... 2004, I won some competitions in, uh, at uh, DEF CON in Las Vegas. And then I decided, okay, I need to, to, to stop that uh, because it took a lot of time and effort. Uh, and uh, also uh, my marriage, my first marriage, first name change uh, ended there. Uh, so I started to recruiting hackers instead and I started business uh, BitSec. And I like, well, uh, in the like 35 hackers I had employed for, for a while there. Uh, so then I l let the young kids do the, the hacking and, and me just uh, collecting all the money. <laughs> uh, not like that, but that's my background a bit. So digital sovereignty, uh, and if you see, um, safeguarding the human rights and freedom of its people. Sounds very... <laughs> Uh, so it's uh, from my perspective, if you are a, a sovereign nation, if you look at the definition for that, you need to have a territory, you need to have a population, and you need a way to uh, administrate, uh, administer the population and uh, defending the territory. Uh, and I think today, in, in the digital world that we're living in, it's not possible at all to administer the <laughs> population in Sweden without the Swedish data. Because everything is digital today. Uh, and if you, do, if, you do, if, you're, if you don't have your control over your data, somebody else has that. And, and the country or the nation that has control over uh, or, or access to our national data has also control of our nation. And, and I think in Sweden today, the nation that has control of our, of our, our data is unfortunately not Sweden, it's the US. Anybody disagree on that? <laughs> no, it's but like, I think the, the, the EU numbers is like 80% of overall data is controlled by the US or US, these uh, uh, US companies. Uh, and I think this is a problem. Um, and I think this is a problem so much that I started writing books about this. Uh, and the, the first book I, I wrote was uh, Honings, Honings Opa, um, 
three years ago now, two, two years ago, <laughs> can't remember. Uh, and, and then the, the following book on that was Tigröga, but now next week I will release the new book, uh, uh, Koda. Uh, but I will talk about that more later. Uh, the cybersecurity threat landscape is quite simple actually. <laughs> Uh, what we have is a, is a cybercrime industry out there. Uh, and the reason why they can do what they do, because we have a lack of security design. This, everything is designed, flawed. Uh, we have poorly programmed systems, and we have poorly maintained systems and programs and software. I think you all can agree on that. Uh, and we also, also have... Um, uh, cryptocurrency nowadays, which totally changed the, 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 the scene. Uh, and that uh, also, if we have also these rogue nation states, and I, Russia for me today is also a rogue nation state, uh, if we think about that. And, and that, all, well, has given us a headache since 2015, about or around when that became an industry. So we have been uh, struggling with this for now almost, no, not 10 years, but almost 10 years. Uh, but everything changed. Uh, or I think will change. Because um, if we look at, we have like had a, a low intensive uh, cyber war with Russia since the 90s. And my Thought of thing, what I think now that will be uh, changing and escalating after the uh, the full scale invasion, uh, full scale war of, uh, on Ukraine. Okay. And we have like cyber warfare, uh, Russia on Ukraine, and we have seen a lot of things there uh, happening, um, a lot of activities, but my. My take on that that the Russian has the Russians has not been so very successful on the cyber warfare arena. It's mostly graffiti, as I see it, denial of service attacks and so on. So, but actually doing something substantial or damaging the the Ukraine uh, on the on the cyber warfare arena has not been so very successful. But the Russians has not been so very successful. In, in all the other fields, uh, in, in, on land and, and sea and air, uh, either. So uh, I think we hugely overestimated their powers <laughs> uh, over time. So we need to have a, a rethink about that. Um, but what's also changed is that Sweden and, and the rest of the West has not been neutral in this conflict. Uh, and we have been sending weapons, and, and, and we have been sending uh, uh, monetary support and, 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 and arms and, and munitions. Uh, which makes us a part of that conflict, if we look at it. So we're not neutral in this aspect. And I think that's going to hurt us a bit uh, later on. But not right now. Uh, if, if I go back to the books a bit... Uh, can I ask a question? Sorry. So Russia, why, considering the fact that we're all thinking that this is such a big problem, so to speak, yep. why in the world have we underestimated or overestimated them in that kind of a way, considering how rogue other people are doing significant damage on a daily basis? Like, why could a state like Russia not do that? Like, it, 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 I don't think there is an easy question. Yeah, well... I can just guess. Mm -hmm. I think that they had some uh, they had some uh, historically had a great army and a big army and so on and, and also great capabilities on the cyber arena too. But I think they have problems keeping staff. I hope that people are that in the cyber industry are have uh, are better people. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's hard to call them good, right? <laughs> yeah, but but if they, 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 I think they will leave. The, the, they they are not 
staying in Russia and, and, and supporting the, uh, Putin's uh, efforts to, to conquer uh, Europe. I think that is part of it. So they're losing, they, they have a brain drain in Russia. Uh, and I, if you take back the non Petya, they have the whole Ukraine. And even if you took down Nets, it's one of the biggest countries in yep. the world. Sure. They were like one server, so it's away from being completely belly out. Yes. So they're not in confidence, just like right now they're really useful. Yeah, but, but it's also very personal based. You, you, because when you think of, of, of not Petya, the, the not Petya attack, you're thinking, oh, okay, it's backed by the nation state, but actually it's just one or two guys who have been writing, writing that code. Uh, so that's not so... I had like 35 hackers in, in my company, Bitsec, and, and, and any of them could have done this attack. So it's not so very complicated when you, when you have the means <laughs> or the knowledge. Uh, but I think it's a lot... The, the, the people... The skilled people that can do that, there are not that many of them, and I think they are, they have left from the services. So that's the less skilled people that are, are still uh, with the SVR. So that's my guess. I hope it is like that, so that, that they are working somewhere else, hopefully, uh, and not doing bad stuff. But we know they are capable because. These hacker groups uh, that are doing the cybercrime, they're also in, in Russia. But they're they not state-backed. Uh, they just have the opportunity to work from Russia, because most, most of them are Russian, but they are tolerated by the government, because they, they, uh, they, they, they can see that the goal, or what they are doing, is helping them in their effort to create chaos in the West. Uh, and also they take, well, I think they, they, they take some bribes also from these uh, groups uh, to keep them, the, them operating in, in, in Russia also, because that's how the society in Russia works. I've been living there for four years, so I, don't, I know how, how the, the society works there. Uh, and everybody taking bribes. Uh, so that's part of their culture. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a good question, um, and, and I think the, the, the simple answer there is it's the, like they have a brain drain. I hope it is like that, because it, then it's brighter for us in the future. <laughs> but I think that they will, yeah, they will come back. Uh, in my first book, I, I, the, the thought with my books were like, yeah, I need to share a lot of uh, knowledge that I uh, accumulated during these 30 years that I've been working with uh, IT security. And I was thinking, okay, shall I write a book uh, about IT security? Well, no, uh, because then you, it's only you guys that will be reading this, and, and that's not a great audience, because I wanted to go... <laughs> it's a great... It's a myth. It's not a, it's not a large audience. It's a great audience, but it's not a large... <laughs> Uh, uh, so it's uh, yeah, it's large. Uh, uh, but uh, so I wanted to to have other people uh, reading about my my experiences, and and so I disguised it in, in these uh, uh, fictional books. Uh, and some of these topics that I put in the books is like national backups. Uh, I uh, invented. Uh, 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 clandestine organization, the backup unit in, in the first book. I, ho uh, I hope we some, at some point will have one of these organizations. Because what happens with Sweden if Sweden gets uh, attacked by Russia and we have a war? Who take care of the backups for, for our government agencies or for Sweden? No one. Somebody is thinking about that, right? Please tell me. No. That's why I put it in my book. Nobody's thinking about that. So, uh, so who in Sweden is res responsible for evacuating our national data? We have a great plan. If we're getting attacked, we have a great plan for what to do with the king. <laughs> uh, and, and that has been the plan since the Second World War. Yeah, we were planning to send the king to England. Uh, and I think that's still the plan or the US. Uh, 
but the, our national data, nobody has, nobody has that plan. Uh, so I, I hope somebody someday after reading my book will have that plan. Um, the electrical power supply, we are, yeah, we are very, uh, without el electricity, nothing will ever work. Uh, and I will say today, if I, when I showed this picture two years ago, nobody knew what it was. Today, everybody is an expert on, on elec the electric, <laughs> electric grid. Um, and everybody knows the problem with distributing the electricity from north to south. Uh, and we also now know today that this system is not 100%. We could have a power outage just by <laughs> because uh, the prices are too high or, or, or the, the production and so on and so forth. Uh, so, um, but that could also start if you have an attack on, this, on the power grid uh, without, yeah. So we need to have more resilience on this area, which means that we need to have more capabilities of producing power uh, in, uh, locally in Sweden, which we took away. Because I, th I think all these water dams destroyed the fish or something like that. Uh, the EU decided that anyway. Um, we have a lot of these data centers located uh, above ground. Uh, and and yeah, I don't like that. Uh, we also have like uh, thinking about Tem uh, things that I, I knew a long time ago, but people seem to forgot somehow, because mostly because it was uh, secret. Uh, we have like Tempest, Rörs, uh, radio, MNA, radio signals coming out from our computers that could be uh, received uh, by somebody <coughs> who is looking at that. Uh, this is what the Russians <coughs> used to spy on us, uh, but it's only the armed forces that protects themselves against these ty types of threats. And I think that is a little bit naive to think that the, the, the Russians are using other means of spying on our, uh, our society than they are using on the armed forces. But it's only the armed forces that are protecting themselves against this threat. And this has been known since uh, the First World War, actually. This is the, the picture of a fueler phone. Uh, that was used to, to spy on the, on the telephone lines, raid, wireless, uh, during the First World War. Um, but we also have some new and old gadgets, uh, like these uh, USB uh, cables with uh, radio transmitters inside. Uh, I've seen them 30 years ago, I saw them uh, at the museum in, in Germany, where they had uh, a, a secret muse museum, where they had uh, Russian uh, cables, uh, or uh, Western cables that they have the, this, dismantled with, with uh, uh, radio transmitters inside them 30 years ago. But now, today, you can buy them on the internet. Uh, so, and there are a lot of these cables, because it's the problem with these cables is not getting them. It's getting them because when you order them, it takes about half, of, almost six months for them to deliver because the demand is so high. So I wonder who is using them and where and how do we protect us against that? Think about that. When you borrow a cable or you get a new cable or you find a cable or you have your cable with you when you're going to an airport or or a hotel or whatever. Uh, so th these are some pictures on, on the implants that are put in inside these cables. Uh, and I have some cables with me if you guys want to look at them um, because you can't see any difference. But you also have like protective security and, and uh, all, all you guys, yeah, everybody probably know who this guy is. Yeah, they, they, they have confessed now, at least, that, the, that he was spying for the Russians. So that's a problem that we have, the inside the threat also. Um, who, are, who, who do we going to trust? Uh, and if you read my book carefully, you will maybe suspect that he is, a, in fact, in my book. Um, uh, so I was right there. Um, and, and then the second book, uh, I was looking at... at um, we, yeah, we, Sweden is one of the most digitized societies in the world, uh, and, and we are 
quite vulnerable because of that. Um, everything is, is handled by computers and also the stock trades and so on. And, and they, that makes it also vulnerable because mo most of the, the trades today is also uh, done by robots uh, uh, and, and are governed by rules and so on. So they can act strange sometimes and, and, and the stock price just goes down or up or whatever. So that's not so. And we also have uh, reliance on single uh, systems. And th this is a major problem because bank IDE is there somebody who doesn't use bank IDE. No, everybody use that. And you use it for everything. It's not just for the bank. It's just if you want to contact Skatteverket, you need a, a bank IDE. If you want to go uh, into the Försäkringskassan, you need the bank IDE. Uh, and if you, yeah, whatever you go. Even if, if I wanted to read the reports for my children at school, I need the bank ID. So I need the bank ID for everything. Uh, and, and in my book, I did not just hack the bank ID, I killed the management of the bank ID. That's also a way to, to disrupt, disrupt the, the, the services. Uh, so you, you can do that also uh, with, with, uh, with force. We are also very, um, we need the infrastructures also. Uh, and in this book, I was thinking, okay, how can I stop internet working in Sweden? So I was looking at all these cables and I thought, oh, maybe I can blow these cables up underwater. Uh, and uh, when people were reading about that, ah, blowing up cables underwater, <laughs> that's excessive. And then Nord Stream happened. And now people think, mm, maybe that's just possible to do that. And I would say, yes, it is. It was not very difficult. Uh, I'm a technical diver, so I know how to do this. Uh, and depth is not so very, uh, uh, it's not so very deep there. So you can do that actually on, on, on a normal scuba diver certificate. Uh, so if you have some um, yeah, explosives and, and a scuba gear, then you, you, then you can blow up some uh, cables. Did you do it? <laughs> I can't comment on that. I know how to do it. <laughs> I know how to do it. Uh, and I wrote this before it happened. So maybe they got inspired by my book. I don't know. Uh, yeah, the next book, yeah. Uh, but uh, anyhow, it's, it's possible to do this. Uh, and it's not so very difficult to know where they are because it's not so very secret, because if you go into a, a, a nautical chart, they need to be there, and, and because otherwise you put your anchor in, in, in them. So they are marked on the nautical chart where these cables are exactly. Uh, and, and if you have uh, some sonar equipment, which almost all boats today have, because they cost like 5,000 kroner, you will get a nice 3D picture also of the, la of the, of the seabed, so you will see exactly where they are. So it's not so very difficult to do that. But they are lying there totally unprotected. And I think you need to blow up, like, if you blow up 10 cables, you won't take away all the connectivity onto the western part of the, of, of, of the internet. But the cap capacity of the, of, the, of the transmission network will, will go down so much that the rest will just congest the, 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 the network that are left there. So it would be total denial of service attack for, for the whole internet. Uh, I promise I won't do it. Ah, we, we have also problems with, with knowing, like in Sweden, uh, in typically, um, if we look at the cyber arena, we, 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 can't, we don't know when we are in a cyber war because we have no uh, regulation about that. The, armed, the Swedish armed forces, they know if there is, if they see a landing boat with, with, with people jumping out of that boat with, with arms and, and, and they are not Swedish soldiers, they can just open fire on them uh, because there is a handbook for that, uh, telling that if, if there is. Uh, but that handbook does not cover the cyber arena. So we don't know if, when, the armed forces can be used 
to, uh, to uh, counter uh, a cyber attack. So uh, by definition, we can't be in a cyber war because we have not set the rules for when Swedish, uh, Sweden is under attack in the cyber domain. And that needs to be done. A lot of other countries have done that. France has said, uh, stated it, if any uh, uh, aggressor will attack our financial systems in, in France, we will respond with armed force, irregardless if that is uh, a, a nation state or otherwise. So they will use the armed forces for that. And I think that's a good idea. <laughs> but uh, in Sweden, we can't do it because we don't know. Uh, we have to call the police or whatever, and, and the police will say, okay, uh, no, you, you can't call the police because that will take seven, eight hours. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to do that. So that was the, the second book. The, now we come to the third book that will come out in, in two weeks. Uh, I hope, yeah, the, the, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, Sweden and West is burnable, <laughs> and, 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 we will, uh, and Russia will be uh, will retaliate, retaliate somehow. Um, nuclear weapons, maybe? I don't know. I don't know. We can you can read about it. <laughs> but the, uh, one of these things that I'm thinking about is uh, supply chain attacks, uh, and historically that has been um, the ways that. Uh, a lot of large companies have been hit, like uh, SolarWinds, the companies like Cisco and, and Microsoft and so on, all the big companies were hit by SolarWinds. Uh, and you have the NotPetya and, and, and you had the Coop attack and now we had Denmark also. But all of these we can connect to Russia actually, uh, not directly maybe to the nation state Russia, but actors that are acting from Russia. Now, that was like I was telling you about, they are tolerated by uh, the nation state. They are not maybe supported by them directly, but indirectly. Uh, but I think this will change because now they have a way to actually get back uh, on us because there are a lot of Russian uh, nationals that are working in open source projects. You like open source, yes? Now you look like, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and I think this is going to be a problem. Um, they are, maybe they can, they, they, by, uh, if, the, if, the, if the, the intelligence services in, in, or the security services in Russia uh, approach somebody and, and ask them, please, can you put this code inside this open source project? Maybe it's not so very easy to say no, because then say, if you don't help me, we will send your father to the Ukraine front and become, uh, yeah, into the uh, meat grinder there. Or something else. Because they're vulnerable to, uh, to some type of blackmail from, from the Russian state, even if they are not uh, supporting Russia. So they, they are vulnerable uh, for that. And I think this is going to be a, a major problem in the future to, to know if the code, because we have these geopolitical uh, uh, conflicts uh, right now with Russia, but maybe we'll have that with China also in the future, uh, and then it becomes an even larger problem. But knowing what type of code uh, you have in your systems, like if you have these SBOOM uh, lists or whatever, and if you try to use, to look at that, there is a lot of uh, open source projects with a lot of, yeah. I don't know, uh, have you thought about this? In this context from Russia? There is some nodding there, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. For sure, I mean, yeah. China as well, right? Because yeah. uh, obviously the US and China dominate the open source world as far as code is delivered for a lot, right? However, it's another bigger problem in closed source, right? Because you can have an employee anywhere that actually enter in something and then you, don't know, you cannot check the code. At least in open source, you can verify the code yourself before to a large extent, much larger than a closed source, right? It, but, but there, yeah, there is sure. a possibility, there, there is a theoretical possibility that you can do that, yeah. but it's but just a theoretical. Everybody do it? No, I, I, I don't think nobody does that actually, if because then you can't. Uh, 
maintain your software <laughs> because th that is a huge task to do especially if you have to do it by yourself mm -hmm. if we could if we could like have like a, a, a Swedish or, or EU uh, board or whatever uh, that does that for us maybe it could be feasible to do that to, to have these code reviews for, for all these releases but to do that for yourself as a company I think that's not it's a theory it's a nice theory, but no. And it's and, and from my perspective, it's easier to uh, infiltrate an open source project than uh, to infiltrate Microsoft, for example. So in in a, in a true sense, if I would be a uh, uh, security uh, agency, I would go for the open source community because that's a low hanging fruit. I don't need to invest too much in that. Uh, so this is going to be a problem, or is already a problem, I don't know. Uh, so that's what I'm touching in, in my new book. Uh, but if we go back to the war, the Ukrainian power grid hacks, there were some hacks there, and, and the, the Russians, they, they succeeded in interrupting the power grid via uh, cyber for 60,000 people. In, I think it was five or six hours. I think we have like storms that done better in Sweden. <laughs> uh, so that was not a big, huge impact. Uh, there is uh, something else that, that I'm more worried about. In in uh, to have a, uh, you have to have a, a balance in, in, in the in the power grid, uh, and there is a special uh, control room to do that. Uh, where you, you look at the frequency and, and you look you need to have the, the input and the output has to match for the power grid uh, in, in, and, and this is a very important thing to have in, in your power grid uh, and if this doesn't work then the power grid will melt uh, physically burn up and, and this is actually uh, not the theory um, if you look at this map and you see that it's a map over all Europe, including uh, Turkey, uh, but not uh, the Nordic countries, except uh, um, Denmark. And this is a totally connected grid. So they are controlling the, 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 the frequency and the input and output for this grid in, in, in Europe. And what happened, um, there was a, a separation that was, you see on the right and left side with the different colors uh, the, because the synchronization was not, the, the, the frequency was out. And so in January, the 8th of January in the morning, uh, 2021, the, the, there were automatic systems that cut this uh, in, in two parts. And the interesting thing about this is there is a report that was written by EU, uh, specialist board, and if you re read the, 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 the conclusions from that, is that if that automatic system had failed, we would have uh, places in Europe where we wouldn't have had power for over six months. Because when these transmitters burn, it takes about six months to make new ones. And there are no in stock. You, you need to buy them uh, or order them. Um, so you, there are no. Uh, the, you have the, You don't have any reserves. Uh, so that was very near miss of a catastrophe for Europe, because we have this system that is. Well, you put all the eggs in one basket, <laughs> and and uh, if. This could be done by automation systems that, if you have some smart hackers, I think we could arrange that too. So, uh, going back to these uh, computer centers, data center, the hyperscalers, uh, they're just like big data warehouses. When I, when I passed them in Katrina Holm where I lived, uh, and I, I can't see any difference between the, these logistic centers and, and these data centers. They just look the same. See if that sound works on this. Okay. Now we've just got some uh, rather dramatic pictures in. 
these showing Russian missiles being fired from hundreds of kilometers away. Now, we're told uh, from the Russian defense minister that four ships were in action here. They launched 26 cruise missiles in all. So that's how I look at the future. <laughs> So...